Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us here today in Chicago. I am Ivo Dalder, the President of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and I'm very pleased that the Council, together with World Business Chicago, are hosting the year today. I'm delighted uh, to have this lecture on U.S.-China, a shared vision of global economic partnership. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Michael Sachs and Jeff Mailhorn at World Business Chicago for their valuable collaboration on this and on so many other programs that we do uh, together here in this great city. We are honored today to be joined by Vice Premier Wong, Secretary Pritzker, and Ambassador Froman for a discussion on trade and commercial ties and relations between the United States and China. I thank them each for participating in this important public discussion. I would also like to thank CT Meetings for their generous support. They include our platinum sponsor, Abbott, our gold sponsor, G GCM Grosvenor, the silver sponsors, A ADM, Boeing, Corning, Dow Chemical, Mead Johnson, Qualcomm, and UL. Finally, we would like to thank our partner, the China General Chamber of Commerce USA. This program is uh, held on the occasion of the 25th session of the US-China JCCT which is taking place in Chicago uh, this week, the only the second time happened outside of Washington or Beijing. Chicago's hosting of the JCCT is evidence of the city's position in the nexus of trade and investment flows between the United States and China. For example, next week will be the first anniversary of the signing of the Gateway Cities Agreement, a major initiative of Major Mayor uh, Emmanuel's to boost commercial and trade links between Chicago and eight of China's most vibrant and important cities. I would like to remind everyone that today's discussion will be on the record. Uh, not that I needed to remind you given what's behind us. Um, we do also encourage you to use social media, including tweeting, but please do silence your phones as you do that. The Chicago Council is live streaming uh, this event on our website. Uh, you will notice that you have headphones on your seat for English and Chinese translation. In terms of today's format, our three panelists will each speak for a few minutes to highlight trends and priorities in U.S.-China relations, and we will then have a discussion and conversation with the panelists. Briefly, let me introduce uh, uh, the three panelists who are joining us today. Um, Vice Pre uh, Premier Wang Yang was appointed as Vice Premier of the State Council of the People's Republic of China um, at the, the 2013 National People's Congress. His portfolio covers agriculture, commerce, poverty reduction, tourism, and water resource management. Secretary Prisker was sworn in as the United States Secretary of Commerce on June 26, 2013. She is the U.S. country's chief commercial advocate and works closely with the business community to expand economic growth through trade, investment, and innovation. Finally, Ambassador Michael Froman was sworn in as the United States Trade Representative on June 21, 2013. He is the President's principal advisor, negotiator, and spokesperson on matters of international trade and investment. So I'm a great honor to welcome to the stage the U.S. Trade Representative, my good friend, Michael Froman. Well, thank you, uh, Evo, and thank you for organizing this event, and thanks to the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and the World Business Chicago for hosting us here. Over the last uh, couple of days, the Vice Premier and Secretary Pritzker and I have gone from event to event. And at each event, I think we each have used various Chinese proverbs to make a point. So for a change of pace, I thought today I would cite uh, an American poet, uh, Carl Sandburg, who grew up here in Illinois and spent a lot of time here in Chicago. And he once said, I am an idealist. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm on my way. <laughs> now Sandburg went on to become one of America's most accomplished poets. But for those of us who may be better at writing prose than poetry, we need to have some sense of where we're going. And that vision is a necessity, particularly where the world's two largest economies are concerned. 
And good vision begins with an appreciation for the past. And when it comes to our economic relationship with China, there's plenty to appreciate. Consider how far the relationship has come since 1983 when the first JCCT was established. Then US exports to China were just over $2 billion. And China was our 20th largest trading partner. Now US exports are more than $120 billion and China is our number two trading partner. Then China had no appreciable investment in the United States. And now China is the fastest growing source of investment in the United States, supporting jobs here as well as in their own country. And we can see the benefit of that growth in more jobs supported by exports, more competitive businesses, greater consumer choice, and the list goes on. And nowhere is that more clear than here in Chicago. Uh, last year, the greater Chicago area exported more to China than ever before, and now there are more than 50 Chinese-owned companies investing and creating jobs here in the greater Chicago area. A century ago, Carl Sandburg dubbed Chicago the nation's freight handler. And today, Chicago is America's leading hub for exports shipped by air to China, responsible for most of all American ex air exports to China. And in that same poem, Sandburg describes Chicago as, quote, planning, building, breaking, rebuilding. Today, Chicago's architects shape not only America's skylines, but also China's. In Shanghai, our people are working side by side on what will be the world's second largest building when it's completed next year. And that tower isn't intended to be a monument, but it will be a fitting tribute to an economic partnership that has grown so much and that the rest of the world looks to. And because the world looks to us, we must look forward together. Let me describe what a shared vision might look like. First and foremost, it's a shared vision that's based on a US-China relationship that is founded on mutual interest and mutual respect. Mutual interest in unlocking opportunity, expanding exports, creating a level playing field for our workers and our businesses, and lowering barriers to investment. Mutual respect in having candid conversations about areas where we disagree and putting creative, bold ideas on the table to bridge those differences. And that's why the JCCT is one of our best tools for strengthening relations and why we've been working so hard to sharpen that tool by creating new opportunities for the private sector to engage with senior level economic officials to address our outstanding issues. And our agenda this year runs the gamut from market access to intellectual property rights protection, to regulatory practices, to a number of other issues that impact our economies. It's also a vision of a shared commitment to rules. We welcome the rise of a peaceful and prosperous China that upholds the rules-based trading system. As China's domestic demand continues to open its economy to fair competition, American workers, farmers, and businesses will find among China's 1.3 billion population and burgeoning middle class. And finally, it's a vision of shared responsibility because with greater economic power comes greater responsibility. And as the world's leading economies, every decision we take sets a precedent. In our trade and investment relations, we must set precedents that benefit not only our countries, but also the rights of workers around the world and the environment that we all share. In sum, the outlines of a shared vision of economic leadership. But we need to remember that our leadership, like our bilateral engagement here this week and throughout this year, is how we translate vision into reality. We need to remember that leadership isn't just somewhere where you end up, it's how you get there. Thank you very much. I know we are here today to discuss the U.S.-China economic relationship, and I will get to that in a moment. But there is significant news from the administration today about our ties with Cuba. And I want to take a moment just to say a few words on this announcement before turning to the business at hand. These historic actions by the President chart a new course for our country's relationship with Cuba and its people. It will improve the lives of millions and will help to spur long overdue economic and political reform across the country. 
Expanding economic engagement between the Cuban American business community will be a powerful catalyst that will strengthen human rights and the rule of law. President Obama believes deeply in the power of commercial diplomacy to change lives and economies for the better. And we are putting this belief to test now in Everyone deserves an opportunity to increase prosperity themselves and for their families. And to that end, I look forward to visiting Cuba to lead our efforts to expand our commercial diplomacy as part of President Obama's initiative to encourage positive change in Cuba. I am proud that the Department of Commerce is playing an integral role in this historic policy change. But I am also proud that the Department of Commerce is playing a leading role along with my partners, uh, Ambassador Froman and Vice Premier Wan Yang in the JCCT. And that is why we are here today. Thank you, Ambassador Froman, for all the work that you do uh, on behalf of our government to make the JCCT and our role successful. And I want to thank Vice Premier Wan Yang for your partnership, for your friendship, and for your commitment to strengthening the U.S. economic relationship. And thank you, Ambassador Evo Dalder and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs for hosting us today and for your work to educate and influence the public discourse on today's most pressing global issues. The success of the U.S.-China commercial relationship is critical to global economic growth and stability. Our two markets are the largest on the planet, and we account for nearly 35 percent of the world's GDP. Together, our populations total 1.6 billion people, just shy of a quarter of the planet. And combined, U.S. and China trade in goods and services add up to about one-fifth of all international trade. So if you step back and consider these statistics, it's difficult to overstate the importance of our bilateral economic relationship to each other and to the global economy. That means there is pressure on us, on Ambassador Froman, on Vice Premier Wan Yang, and on me to deliver. To quote Confucius, our responsibility is heavy and our road is long. And so for us, that road must guide us towards a deeper and more effective U.S.-China relationship. Meeting here in Chicago, in the city of broad shoulders, the, responsi fa the responsibility falls to our shoulders to lead, to deepen strategic trust, and to build a stronger partnership between our countries and our respective business communities. That partnership demands mutual respect and must produce tangible results that yield mutual, mutual benefits. That partnership requires action, because as my mother used to say, tell me, actions speak louder than words. This year's JCCT represents an extraordinary opportunity, but it is also a moment for us to be honest and frank about the challenges before our governments and our business communities. Friends and partners do not always agree, but they do speak candidly to one another. And for the past 20 years, we have witnessed an unabashed rush to invest in China. Businesses saw a massive market for American goods in China, a growing middle class, an affordable production platform. Recently, that rush has slowed. Foreign companies are starting to approach the Chinese market with greater caution. This fall, foreign direct investment into China slumped to a four-year low. The question is, what has changed? The market has not suddenly dried up. Demand still exists, and China's economy is growing. But concerns over issues like sanctity of contracts, transparency, rule of law, intellectual property protection, and other issues are beginning to take their toll. And to some extent, the challenges facing China are not unique. 
global competition for investment has become more intense. Foreign companies need to know they are on equal footing with domestic companies if governments hope to attract their capital. None of us can rest on our laurels and expect future prosperity. None of us can assume that just because our country was an attractive place to invest in five years ago, it will remain an attractive destination five years. Vice Premier Wong, Ambassador Froman, and I understand these dynamics. We understand that the JCCT is a forum where we can convey the concerns of our private sectors to each other and where we can take steps that help both of our countries enhance our competitiveness. This ambition is what prompted the three of us during a tea break at last year's JCCT in Beijing to begin reconsidering how the JCCT works. We all recognize the need to bring this into the 21st century. We, I believe the Vice Premier captured the sentiment well in a recent letter to Ambassador Froman and me where he said, and I quote, both sides need to determine how best to improve the JCCT and thereby unleash its full utility. Our reimagined JCCT will continue to serve as a cornerstone of our bilateral economic relationship, but will also serve as a platform for government leaders to hear from our business community. To that end, we have asked American and Chinese private sector leaders to join us here in Chicago for a number of events to share their expertise and to tell us about the opportunities and obstacles to do more business together. This will be a broader dialogue than ever before. It will feature government to government, business to business, and business to government discussions. It is only the second time, as the ambassador said, that this event is being held outside either Beijing or Washington, D.C. But of business, we are putting commerce back into the Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade. Notwithstanding all these changes, our basic goal remains unchanged, promoting more openness, more trade, and more commerce between the United States and China. Over the course of three decades, we have seen what is possible as China opened its doors to global trade and commerce. In that time, approximately 600 million Chinese people have been lifted out of poverty. That is nearly twice the total U.S. population. American companies have contributed to China's extraordinary economic success but working hand in hand with Chinese partners. From improving our water, their water infiltration processes to assisting low-income farmers to delivering state-of-the-art equipment to Chinese hospitals, the technology and expertise of U.S. firms has helped improve the lives of millions of people across China. The benefits of openness though, have not just flowed in one direction. In recent years, Chinese investment in the United States has grown dramatically. In fact, over the last few years, Chinese investment in the United States has grown more rapidly than that of any other country. And we want to encourage more. Today, Chinese direct investment supports more than 14,000 American jobs. So, with so many Chinese business leaders here today, thank you for supporting American jobs. The JCCT should be the setting for us to build on exactly that kind of progress, but it is not the only vehicle to strengthen our relationship. Another opportunity will come in April when U.S. Energy Secretary Ernest Muniz and I will lead what we are calling a super trade mission to China. This will be the first commerce trade mission featuring two commerce, two cabinet secretaries in over a decade. Our visit will focus on expanding U.S.-China clean energy cooperation. We will explore opportunities for American businesses to support smart cities 
and smart growth in China through areas such as green building and transit, energy retrofitting and energy efficiency, clean air and water technologies, and more. It's hard to imagine this particular trade mission coming at a more opportune moment in our history. Just a few weeks ago, President Obama and President Xi reached a landmark agreement to tackle climate change through mutual commitments to reduce emissions. This is not the only breakthrough announcement from the President's recent trip. Our Presidents also agreed to extend the validity of tourist and travel business visas from one year to 10 years, and student visas from one year to five years. This visa agreement will increase travel and tourism between our countries, produce extraordinary benefits for our economies, and personal connections between our young people, our families, and our communities. Both of these accords will have ripple effects for many years to come. They will leave us they will leave behind a positive legacy for this generation of Chinese and American leaders. So in many ways, our reimagined JCCT is an opportunity for us, the JCCT co-chairs, to build a positive legacy as well. It's an opportunity for us to create a legacy of cooperation, respect, and stronger U.S.-China economic ties. Leaving this legacy will require tremendous amount of work this week and going forward. But if we succeed, I believe we can make the G JCCT into a more effective mechanism. We can use the JCCT to promote more commerce, to deepen trust, and to address real business challenges. This is an opportunity now, and it's up to us to seize it. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to a productive discussion. Now, it is my honor and privilege to introduce our partner in this effort uh, to take our country's relationship to the next level, and someone I consider a friend, Vice Premier Wan Yang. In his previous post, in Guangdong, Sorry. the Vice Premier built a legacy of transparency in local government. Now, as China's point person on commerce, trade, tourism, agriculture, and more, he is working to establish a national legacy of greater openness and engagement in the global economy. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming a great leader and a champion for a deeper U.S.-China relationship and partnership Vice Premier Wan Yang. I'd like to thank Secretary Priska for regarding me one of her best friends. Having said that, I need to point out that when Secretary Priska and Ambassador Dowder introduced my profile, they missed one part of my profile, that is, I'm also responsible for tourism. So every time you travel to a beautiful place, it is within my responsibility. It is a great pleasure for me to make a speech here. On behalf of the Chinese delegation, I wish to thank the Chicago Council for Global Affairs for making this event a reality. And I also wish to pay high tribute to people from various sectors dedicated to the business relations and cooperation between the two countries. The China-US commercial relationship is a constant theme always generates new ideas, and there are numerous debates and discussions on the topic. As the two countries are celebrating the 35th anniversary of diplomatic relations, we are here for the event under the theme of U.S.-China, a shared vision of economic leadership. 
to set the course for the future business relations between our two countries. This event is of great significance. My three China, uh, American colleagues shared their wonderful views, and I'm, I've got a lot of inspirations. I would like to share also some of my personal First, the economic partnership is not a forced arrangement made by the two governments. It's a result of a common aspirations of the two sides. Just like our friends are chosen by ourselves, not designated by our parents, our economic partnership today is a choice made by business on the basis of commercial considerations. And the government has only responded to the aspirations of the market players and done something that has won the hearts and the votes of the people. As a result, we have become economic partners. When President Obama visited China last month, Xinhua News International and Tencent carried out a joint public opinion poll with the participation of nearly 90,000 netizens. One of the questions was, on which issues do you want to see cooperation between China and the United States? The number one answer was that the two countries should enhance coordination in the field of economic and trade relations, and the rate was 45%. Coincidentally, the U.S. also carried out a survey this year, and 96% of the surveyed American companies still regarded China as one of the five markets for global strategic investment, which was a record high in the past five years. Second, by becoming economic partners, China and the United States made a history of win-win cooperation between major countries of different co systems. China and the United States are different in national conditions and level of development, social systems and ideologies, and for that reason, we were once estranged for over 20 years. 42 years ago, when President Nixon visited Beijing the first time, he said very frankly to Premier Zhou Enlai that I have come for the interest of the United States. The statesmen of ge that generation broke the system, system and ideology eyes with great courage and made the history of the two countries becoming important economic partners not which has not only benefited our two peoples, but also the whole world. The past 35 years of our diplomatic relations proves that countries, major countries of different systems do not necessarily fall in the suicidist trap, and our systematic, systematic and cultural differences will not stop uh, the two countries become economic partners for win-win cooperation. As China integrates into global economy comprehensively and as the size of Chinese economy continues to grow, it will still need strategic vision from the USI China. History already proves that confrontation and cooperation both need to have costs, but costs of cooperation are lower than and, and can bring more returns in order with a strategic consensus for stronger cooperation and win-win results, we will be able to manage differences, resolve, difference, uh, resolve our problems, and become economic partners for sustainable growth. Third, although China and the United States are partners in global economy, it is the United States who lead the world. When China started reform and opening up, the United States was already leading, playing the leading role in global economic system and rules. By opening up, we are ready to join this system and basically accept these rules and are ready to play a constructive role in the international economic system. Although China's economy is the second largest in the world, we are still only 55% of that of the United States, and per capita GDP was only one-eighth one of the United States. When I visited Finland, the pr Prime Minister of Finland said that if we combine the populations of the two countries together, we will have the largest population in the world. And that is also the true uh, when it comes to China and the United States. And more importantly, um, the key technologies driving global economic development 
and uh, the rules underpinning global economic order are still led by the United States. We have a very clear understanding about that. We have not in no intention nor challenge the leading position of the United States. What we want is to cooperate with the United States, and hopefully in this process, the United States can better understand the ideas, national conditions of China, and the past chosen by the Chinese people, and not allow the political differences stand in the way of economic cooperation between us. I also know that many American friends have questions on their mind. As China becomes more stronger, stronger economically and more competitive, will the economic partnership last for long? As China's economic growth moderates, will China continue to bring exciting development opportunities for American companies? As China strengthens market supervision, is it targeted at American companies? I can tell you clearly that although China's economic strength is changing, our policy of developing economic relations with the United States remains unchanged. The format and content of the economic relations between us may change, but the nature of the relationship of win-win cooperation will not change. Since the cooperation already benefit, benefited both sides, what reason do we have not to continue it? First, China will continue to pursue the win-win strategy of opening up and take a new round of steps to open up at a higher level. We will adhere to the world trade system and rules, continue to pursue bilateral, multilateral, regional and sub-regional cooperation in opening up, expand converging interests with other countries and regions, reform our market access, cost supervision, quarantine, inspection, examination systems, ex expedite negotiations on new topics such as environmental protection, investment protection, government procurement, e-commerce, and formulate a global high standard network of free trade areas in order to promote opening reform through opening up. Secondly, we will continue to promote economic structural adjustment and promote more balanced, coordinated and sustainable economic development. The just concluded Central Economic Work Conference clearly pointed out that in economic development, we will continue to focus on improving the efficiency and quality of economic growth, adapt to the new normal of economic development and shift from the growth model and uh, structural readjustment, and we will shift from factors-driven growth to innovation-driven growth and give greater importance to sustainability. We will cultivate new hotspots, consumption, such as outlay care, tourism, education, health, culture, sports, encourage emerging industries, such as the internet, e-commerce, and tap amount. We will implement a more active import strategy and import more advanced technology equipment, key components, clean energy, and other consumers. We will retire backward capabilities in manufacturing and improve the structure. As the Chinese consumer market further expands, there will be greater demand for foreign advanced technology equipment and services. Third, we will accelerate the improvement of legal system for the socialist market economy and cultivate an internationalized and law-based business environment. We will speed up the unification of laws and regulations for Chinese and foreign capital and establish a fair, open and transparent market rules and eliminate various laws and regulations hindering a fair competition. We will ensure that economic sector will participate in the market competition in an open, fair, just manner and have equal protection of the law. We will persist in strict, standardized and civil law enforcement and ensure foreign companies' right to information, expression, supervision, and seek remedies. We will deepen foreign-related judicial reform, establish IPR courts, improve IPR judicial protection work mechanism, and streamline IPR accreditation and certification procedure. 
and provide equal protection for the rights and interests of Chinese and foreign companies. In strict accordance with law, we will provide foreign companies with judicial assistance, lawyer services, and uh, translation services, and provide facilitations for them. Lastly, I wish to emphasize that a mature economic relationship will need institutional guarantee. We now have over 90 cooperation mechanisms between the two governments. A JCCT is both extinguisher to problems and a propeller for cooperation. I think after so many meetings of JCCT, we have achieved a goal of the mechanism and our future meeting will also work to create a better environment for practical cooperation between our businesses. Just now, Secretary Priska quoted a line from Lao Tzu. I would also like to cite Mr. Rockefeller. He said that a friendship founded on business is better than business founded on friendship. An economic partnership between China and the United States based on broad common interest is solid and enduring and can stand the test of changes in the international landscape. The business cooperation between China and the United States in this relationship, cooperation has been the mainstream, although differences always exist. But this is only natural, just like a running river will have waves here and there. We will not allow our views to be blocked by intricate developments. Rather than use a microscope to find fault, we should use a telescope to look ahead. I believe that our visional people from the two countries with wisdom and a sense of responsibility will steer and propel the big ship of China-US business cooperation and keep it on the right course and make sure that the ship will reach the shore of win-win cooperation. Thank you. Uh, Vice Premier, Secretary, Ambassador, thank you so much for your, for your comments. Uh, very much appreciated. We have a time for, for a little bit of a discussion, and, and let me start uh, with something that Secretary Pritzker raised, which is the changing nature of the JCCT. Uh, this is the 25th anniversary of the JCCT, and it is the first year that the dialogue has expanded beyond government to government to uh, include events like this and events that involve the private sector. Um, what I, well, I wanted to ask, what, what do you hope to accomplish uh, by, and by changing the JCCT and enlarging it by bringing in the private sector? Perhaps, um, Vice Premier, can we start with you? Well, well, I think I'm stealing the thunder from the host to quote a Chinese proverb. But we also have a saying in China, the guest should oblige with the request of the host. So I will respond first. JCCT, this is the 25th year for the session. But just as you said, together with Ambassador Froman and Secretary Prisco, we took over the mechanism only last year. And since then, a common feeling among the three of us is that we must have the existing mechanism improved. And how do we do that? Last year, during the last year's session, we reached a common ground, but without coming up with specific ideas, and this specific reform plan was actually put forward by the secretary and the ambassador. And actually, the specific plan has been implemented this year. I cannot agree more with this plan. Last night, when I was hosted by Secretary Priska, last night, I said from the bottom of my heart that she is the best candidate for her current position because she is from business, she knows what business wants. So all the reform plans she has championed 
are best serving the interests of the business sector. And from the response I got from the business sector today, from all the events, I think the reimagining process has been successful. So what's on, my, on the top of my plan, mind is not or to not to answer your question, but what can I do tomorrow, next year, in order to do as good as she does this year? Thank you. Uh, Ambassador, I, think, I don't know how to uh, top that but, um, or to respond to that, but I will say the following. I think that uh, when the three of us last year um, felt that the issues that we have to deal with are pretty well understood, uh, and but they needed input from the private sector in order to bring them to a reality from just being language and just being uh, uh, outcomes of a discussion. What we're addressing is really going to be put into practice. And so I think that what has been very helpful oh, throughout the day today is that we've really heard from business leaders and leading up to the JCCT, not only here's their particular issue, but really how what we're doing impacts the ability to actually do commerce both uh, in, bo in both directions and to do trade in both directions. And I think that, that, that you know, we're at the beginning of this effort to reimagine and I know that over time we will continue to improve, but I think as a first step, uh, it's been quite productive, uh, uh, a quite productive effort. And then, and the vice premier uh, suggested to us that we include travel and tourism as an as an as a sector focus, and that was very prescient given obviously the announcements of our presidents. But also, frankly, I think it was really insightful to understand there's a real demand by our people and the Chinese people to uh, want to have greater access to each other's countries. And uh, by bringing the leadership of both our hospitality industries together this afternoon, there's a serious dialogue going about on about how they can cooperate and then out of that is coming real suggestions of what are the policy issues that we have got to address. So I think that this enhances our conversation and it will be ever evolving. Ambassador Perlman? Uh, well, just I'm not sure what I can add to that other than to say what works both looking at the longer vision of our relationship and issues like travel and tourism, issues like investment, but also strategic issues like excess capacity, which we'll be talking about tomorrow and how the excess capacity in, in various sectors affects the global economy and affects our bilateral relationship, that's an important strategic issue for our get, to get our hands around. I think the challenge is we need to keep our eyes on the larger vision, but also make concrete steps along the way to deal with the real issues that are affecting our economic relationship on a day-to-day on a -day basis. And it's kind of two-track process that we're trying to accomplish here. Let me move on to the next question uh, for, for Vice Premier Wong. Uh, China has recently intensified market regulations as anti-monopoly investigations, and some U.S. companies have become increasingly worried that China's investment environment may now be tightening. How would you address that concern of these companies? Uh, I have address this question on many occasions because this reflects a common concern of the U.S. business community. My answer on many occasions, or well, these occasions include on the 14th of December when I met General Scowcroft, his delegation of the Aspen Institute. At that meeting, Mr. Joseph Nye asked a similar question, and I thanked him uh, for uh, preparing me for the event in the U.S. because I expected this question and now this expected question. Well, in my view, China has strengthened 
supervision, including anti-monopoly, for the purpose, first, to have a better opening up. Last year, China has agreed to negotiate the bit with BIT, with the US, with the negative list model. And this means that apart from those on the negative list, China will open the sectors, not on the list. And friends from the business community of the US, some may know, some may not, that previously China focused on review and approval to control the access of foreign capital. And after the negative list, they opened wider and under that condition, without proper ongoing and exposed supervision, there will be more risks on the Chinese market. That does not mean risks posed by the American investors. I mean, after the negative list is implemented, we need to provide national treatment for all the Chinese domestic companies. China is improving its market economy. If foreign capital and private capital are not well regulated, then it will be, there will be huge consequences. This morning, I quoted an example when I was a party secretary of the Guangdong province. Shenzhen of Guangdong province is adjacent to Hong Kong. All the drivers strictly abide by traffic rules in Hong Kong. But the moment they entered Shenzhen, they choose not to obey the rules because in the city of Shenzhen or on the mainland of China, the regulation or supervision is not that strict as in Hong Kong. Well, you may be interested in what will happen after the supervision is strengthened. Will there be any selective enforcement for foreign companies? Let me share with you some data. We started enforcement of anti-monopoly law only six years ago, and in the past six years, NDRC, the main enforcement authority in China, handled 339 institutes, and only 33 are foreign companies, only 10%. And the state-owned companies in China got the most fines. I also have another concern if the investment environment will be tightened, as the question stated. Let me say that thanks to opening up, China is integrated more to the world and China's economy has developed well. Therefore, there's no reason for China not to continue with reform and opening up. We in China often say that reform and opening up is a crucial choice that determines the destiny of modern China. Therefore, we will not waver in our commitment. And I said before that if one uses a particular case to conclude that the investment environment in China is not good. Particular cases exist in China, in the US, but we shall not generalize these cases to judge the policies of a country. Well, lastly, let me say that the Amer MCHAM in China conducted a survey 
in American business in China. And 71% uh, of the American companies achieved increase and financial profitability. And 73% of the American companies decided to increase their investment in China. Of course, the percentage was lower than the previous year, but 73% is a big number. Well, I think these statistics speak for themselves, and it is more accurate to use these statistics to characterize China's investment environment. Over the past four years, the U.S. investment in China decreased. As Secretary Priska said, I believe this is a correct number because it makes sense. The financial crisis has seriously affected the competitiveness of all companies, the American companies included. Why there are more investment in China because the RMB appreciated and there are demands for merger and acquisition with a lower price. And that's why more Chinese invest in the U.S. And this also explains why the U.S. investment in China declines. And it also conforms to the global FDI trend. I can say with a great sense of responsibility that China has not slowed the pace of reform and opening up, and the investment environment is not tightened. Please take my word, and if you want to look at if you want to know what happens next, please follow China's development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. One final uh, question for, for Secretary Pritzker and Ambassador Froman. China has increasingly been playing an active role in the negotiations uh, of free trade agreements. Uh, do you see this as a development that is beneficial to regional and global trading system? And are there opportunities for the United States and China perhaps to work together to liberalize trade around the world? Uh, well, thank you. And, and I, think, uh, I think it is useful that there are a lot of activities going on right now to liberalize trade and open up markets to further integrate the Asia-Pacific uh, region. And China is active in this area, as are a number of other countries throughout the region, and as is the United States as well. There are different models about how best to do this. And uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which uh, we believe will set an ambitious, comprehensive, high standard set of rules for the region to raise labor and environmental standards, strengthen intellectual property rights, but also access to innovation, uh, uh, create rules around state-owned enterprises so they compete fairly with private sector entities, maintain an open and free internet. Those are the kinds of rules that we think are important to define the trading system in the region in addition to tearing down tariffs and, and non-tariff barriers. Uh, but each country pursues its own way of doing that. And I think uh, what's important is that we're all moving forward to further integrate the region and create opportunity. This is a region that currently has about 570 million middle class consumers. And that's anticipated to grow to 2.7 billion middle class consumers over the next 15 years. So it's critically important to the United States. We are a Pacific uh, a power. We are an Asia Pacific economy. And we see very much the future of our ec economy being tied into and uh, the integration of this region, uh, the well-being of our economy tied to the well-being of this region. And that's why the president uh, engaged in the rebalancing strategy towards Asia and why we're pursuing TPP along the way. With regard to the bilateral relationship, uh, we are actively involved with China on a range of, of bilateral and multilateral and plurilateral initiatives, uh, including the bilateral investment treaty that the vice premier referred to, and including cooperating with each other in the WTO context to try and help make progress on the information technology agreement, on the environmental goods agreement, 
and overall in the, to try and strengthen the multilateral trading system. I'll, I'll just add a, a sm uh, one more thought, which is, is that you know, if you think about uh, global capital, global capital is going to determine where it's going to go and what it's, uh, where it's going to invest based upon the landscape in front of it. And as companies uh, determine which countries where to put their capital and where to invest, they're going to be looking at what are the rules, what, are, what is the ability to protect your intellectual property, what is the opportunity uh, to find a skilled labor infrastructure look like. And for all of us, as we look at doing uh, trade agreements, uh, that is the question that we are facing. We are trying to address and to make uh, an opportunity for greater trade, greater investment, and greater prosperity for our people. And as Ambassador Froman said, what, is, what are the standards going to be in the 21st century? And I think that it is, it is particularly uh, important that you know, the China and the United States is participating in a very um, detailed fashion, which is what we do. The fundamentals and the core of the JCCT is really a trade discussion about very particular issues. And as we address the complicated and difficult challenges that face us, because the easy things get resolved. What's left for us, the three of us, in the meetings that we have are the hard things. And what we're trying to sort out is how do you make an environment where you can attract global capital and that therefore our peoples and our countries uh, uh, enjoy a certain prosperity. And that is um, what's in front of us. And of course we welcome the fact that China is doing trade agreements around the world. China is going to trade around the world and that's very important. I think what we're trying to focus on is how do we through this mechanism and through this dialogue, uh, figure out how to mutually uh, benefit from uh, the opportunity to attract global, role each of our countries play in the global supply chain of product creation as well as product delivery to each of our peoples. And it's, um, it, is at one, it is a very complex uh, process that we go through. Uh, to figure this out, and obviously each of us is trying to represent the various interests of our countries, keeping in mind the fact we have to attract global capital. Secretary Pritzker, uh, thanks very much for uh, this answer. Uh, Vice Premier uh, Awan, thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. It's been an enlightening discussion, I must say. Um, I would ask the uh, audience first uh, to um, uh, to uh, thank our panelists for this discussion, and secondly, to remain seated as uh, we, uh, we exit. So again, thank you so much for coming to Chicago, and thank you for this discussion. <laughs>